Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings and thank you for the good things that you do unto your people. I want to ask of thee that uh, you may guide us and you may give us a message from heaven that is needful for this hour as we look at the church history in Jesus' name. Amen. And so once again, uh, I just want to say praise the Lord for all the blessings that flow through Jesus Christ unto us. The Lord has been wonderful unto me and my family, and I know that he has been wonderful to you. And I'm glad that I can uh, be able to bring these messages unto us at such a, at such a time as this. And it has been my desire always that uh, we may grasp the concepts of righteousness by faith, the cleansing of the sanctuary, and um, we may get to understand the three angels' messages practically. All these messages, if we get them right practically, then we will be in a position to reach the message with power that uh, is attended by the latter rain, and it will be a loud cry to the whole world. In the Previous presentations, we have already done two presentations. That is the introductory part, uh, a message uh, with the uh, divine credentials. And then uh, in the last uh, presentation, we looked at um, the ministerial institute, the, uh, the lead up to the uh, general conference uh, session in 1888. And so I just want to pick from there and now come into the conference itself uh, after the ministerial institute and the things that we saw. I pray that this will not be long. The previous one was long. So I'll just jump into the matter straight away and um, uh, let us see how the session itself was. Let us see how the session itself uh, was. This is the Minneapolis uh, 1888 General Conference session, the 1888 General Conference uh, session. Now, uh, in a lead up to this session in May of uh, 1888, Senator H.W. Blair of New Hampshire introduced a bill, that is Blair Bill for the observance of the Lord's Day Sunday in the U.S. Senate. This was for Adventist a sign of the imminent end of the world. Revelation 13 was being fulfilled. This was not time to make changes. As uh, we shall see that uh, the Britain was so concerned with changes being made that uh, they eventually rejected the message thinking that uh, something more dangerous was being um, advocated by the Britain who are bringing in the message of righteousness by faith. Um, the General Conference uh, convened on uh, Wednesday, October 17 at 9 a.m. Stephen N. Haskell, born in 1833 uh, uh, and uh, arrested in 1922, was the temporary chairman in the advent of G.I. Butler, who was sick. And uh, we were able to look into the previous presentation why G.I. Butler, the president of the General Conference, was sick. It is because his mind had been perplexed by the things that were happening and the messages that uh, Jonas and Wagon were bringing in. And there are other things that preoccupied his mind, which made him sick. And then he only communicated through telegram in uh, his um, sick bed. So Stephen N. Haskell was the temporary chairman in his absence. Now, about 90 delegates represented 27,000 church members, the progress of new mission fields, the distribution of labor, city evangelism, a new ship for the South Pacific, Bitcoin, and many other items were taken up. In, uh, in the lead up to the general conference, we had the Ministerial Institute where actually bad blood was, uh, 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 bad blood was uh, really manifested. Uh, between now, um, Wagona, Jones, Uriah Smith, and uh, uh, G.I. Butler, and uh, uh, is it R.A. Underwood? And so, 
as uh, we come to the general compensation itself, we find that uh, uh, it was uh, not something to be an easy one seeing these differences that were already there. And so the Lord, Ellen <clears throat> White, commanding in Tion 91 92, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elders Wagon and Jonas. It represented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. And here we have this little book, Christ and His Righteousness by E.J. Wagon, which you can obtain and be able to read. Uh, volume, uh, Minneapolis, um, uh, October 19, 1888, number one. At 2.30 p.m., Elder E.J. Wagner discussed the question of the law of God and its relation to the gospel of, the, of Christ. The discussion was based principally on the epistle to the Romans. J. White wrote in present truth, the keeping of the fourth commandment is all important present truth, but this alone will not save anyone. We must keep all ten of the commandments and swiftly follow all the directions of the New Testament and have living active faith in Jesus. That that is back then. Uh, that is a statement from uh, uh, James White. And so, in uh, in uh, in uh, in review and herald in 1890, Sister White said, as a people. We have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of the Lord that had made a dew or rain. We must preach Christ in the law. By then, Seventh day Adventists were only known for the law. That is what is implied in the quote that we had preached the law and the people knew that we are the people of the law. And Sister White is saying that we have preached this thing until we are as dry as Mount Gilboa, the hills of the Lord. And so there needs to be, uh, there needs for Christ to be preached in the law. There needs for Christ to be preached in the law. And who was the person or the messengers of the message? It was Jonas and Wagner, who the Lord revealed to them how to present Christ in the law. In 1887, she wrote from Europe, a revival of uh, true goodness among us, the greatest and most urgent of all, and it's in Riven Herald. Uh, um, 1887. Again, uh, the setting of all this in 1888. Uh, here she she says that uh, in uh, I have had some things clearly open to me night before last. How much better position would you be in today? And had you believed the words that God gave me for you at Minneapolis? and how much you might have done to stop the tide of unbelief that was flowing so swiftly at the meeting. So when they came to the general conference session itself, there was um, a tide of um, unbelief that was flowing swiftly in that meeting because already there was blood, bad blood in the ministerial institute. I presented before you the things which the Lord had presented before me while in Switzerland as well as in 1882, recounting on this matter. Uh, and we are looking at the time setting and uh, what was it actually what happening. How did Wagona come to possess or to be the messenger of the message of justification by faith or Christ and his righteousness? We read, uh, we read that uh, uh, this is the personal experience he, he gave uh, uh, in 1916 of uh, how he came to uh, uh, be used as a messenger in uh, bringing forth the message of justification by faith. Saying, Christ is primarily the word of God, the expression of God's thoughts, and the scripture are the word of God simply because they reveal Christ. It was with this belief that I began my real study of the Bible 34 years ago, that is in 1882, because he's giving uh, a testimony uh, uh, in uh, 1916. So it was with this belief that I began my real stu study of the Bible 34 years ago. At that time, Christ was set be before my eyes evidently crucified for me. 
I was sitting a little apart from the body of congregation in the large tent at camp meeting in Hillsburg one gloomy Sabbath afternoon. I have, an, I have no idea what was the subject of the discourse. Not a word nor a text have I ever known. All that has remained with me was what I saw. Suddenly, a light shone around me, and the tent was, for me, far more brill brilliantly lighted than if the noonday sun had been shining. And I saw Christ hanging on the cross, crucified for me. In that moment, I had my first positive knowledge, which came like an overwhelming flood, that God loved me and that Christ died for me. God and I were the only beings I was conscious of in the universe. I knew then by actual sight that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. I was the whole world with all it is seen. I'm sure that Paul's experience on the way to Damascus was no more real than mine. I resolved at once that I would study the Bible in the light of that revelation in order that I might help others to see the same truth. I have always believed that every part of the Bible must set forth, must must set forth with more or less vividness the glorious revelation Christ crucified. And so in 1882 starts the journey for E.J. Wagner to start studying this message of Christ crucified and bringing in the message of uh, righteousness by faith. We are looking at the time setting of uh, all this. Again, we read in uh, uh, this is uh, Just a moment. This is Wagona in uh, the Everlasting Covenant. This is what um, he has to say. Wagona in Everlasting Covenant, he says, Many years ago, the writer sat in a ten at one dismal rainy afternoon where a servant of the Lord was presenting the gospel of his grace, not a word of the text or text used, nor of what was said by the speaker has remained with me. I have never been conscious of having heard a word, but in the midst of the discourse, an experience came to me that was the turning point in my life. Suddenly a light shone about me and the tent seemed illumined as though the sun was shining. I saw Christ crucified me for me and to me, was revealed for the first time in my life that the fact that God loved me and that Christ gave himself for me personally. It was all for me. If I could describe my feelings, they will not be understood by those who have not had a similar experience and to such no explanation is necessary. I believe that the Bible is the word of God penned by holy men who wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I knew that this light that came to me was a revelation direct from heaven. Therefore, I knew that in the Bible, I should find the message of God's love for individual sinners, and I resolved that the rest of my life should be devoted to finding it there and making it plain to others. The light that shone upon me that day from the cross of Christ has been my guide in all my Bible study. Wherever I have turned in the sacred book, I have found Christ set forth as the power of God to the salvation of individuals, and I have never found anything else. So this is, we are looking at the time setting of everything and how Wagner came to have a turning point in his own uh, life. So on the second day at 9 a.m. at the E.J. Wagner, we are told that uh, gave another lesson on the law and the gospel. Remember the first lesson he gave, uh, remember the first lesson that he gave I just backtrack. At 2 30, this is the first lesson. At 2 30 p.m., and EJ Wagona discussed the question of the law of God and its relation to the gospel of Christ. The discussion was based principally on the epistle to the Romans. So the law, the, the, the law of God and its relation to the gospel of Christ. And this was a presentation from the book of Romans. Uh, and then on the second day at 9 a.m., Elder E.J. Wagner gave another lesson on the law and the gospel. In this lesson, the first and second chapters of Galatians in connection with Acts 15 were partially presented by him to show that the same harmony existed there 
as elsewhere that the key to the book was justification by faith in Christ. So day one, the epistle of Rome, day two, Galatians and the chapter, a chapter, chapters of Galatians and uh, in connection with the chapter in Acts and his main burden was uh, to see how that uh, there existed harmony between these books and uh, the whole thing was justification by faith in Christ with the emphasis on the latter word, faith in Christ. That liberty in Christ was always freedom from sin and that separation from Christ to some other means of justification always brought bondage. He stated incidentally that the law of Moses and the law of God were not distinctive terms as applied to the ceremonial and moral laws and cited Numbers 15, 22, 24 and Luke 2, 23 to 24 as proof. He closed at 10, 15 by asking those present to compare Acts 15, 7 to 11 with Romans 3, 20 to 25. Appeals were made by Brother Wagner and Sister White to the brethren, old and young, to seek God, put away all spirit of prejudice and opposition, and strive to come into the unity of faith in the bonds of brotherly love. On Friday, October 19, 1888, at 9 a.m., Elder Wagner continued his lessons on the law and gospel. The scriptures considered were the 15th chapter of Acts and the 2nd and 3rd of Galatians, compared with Romans chapter 4 and other passages in Romans. His purpose was to show that the real point of controversy was justification by faith in Christ, which faith is reckoned to us as to Abraham for righteousness. The covenant and promises to Abraham are the covenant and promises to us. On uh, Wednesday, October 25, 1888, a series of instructive lectures, lectures has been given on justification by faith by Elder E.J. Wagner. The closing one was given this morning with the foundation principles all are agreed, but there are some differences in regard to the interpretation of several passages. The lectures have tended to a more thorough investigation of the truth, and it is hoped that the unity of the faith will be reached on this important question. An opportunity was given for both Jonas and Wagner to respond. And when the time came, they stood up from side by side with open Bibles, alternating in the reading of 16 Bible passages, primarily from the book of Romans and Galatians. This was their only answer. And without a word of comment, they took their seats. During the entire time of the readings, there was a hushed stillness over the vast assembly. The Bible spoke for itself. Return of the latter in by Ron Duffy, page 135 and to under 136. Now, I'm so um, I'm so glad with the, what Ron Duffy actually reports about um, Wagner and Jonas because in the lead up the ministerial, we 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 read how uh, Sister White warned Alonzo Trevor Jonas of uh, being harsh to all the brethren and. Uh, not showing respect, and even the anger he gave on the ten horns of uh, the book of Daniel chapter 7, which was so disrespectful to Uriah Smith. But here now in the general conference session, after um, E.G. White having a talk with them, when they were uh, actually uh, pushed to defend what they were defending and pressed on the wall, even after being denied times to present and all that stuff, they never went into apologies. They never went into quarreling, but they opened their Bibles, read passages, and sat down quietly without remonstrating or res having resentment as even Eti Jones was having earlier. This shows that these young men, Alonzo Trevor Jones and uh, E.J. Wagona, were growing in faith. Unlike when they started, uh, there was still some uh, 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 sports that could be uh, noted in their way of presentation and in their way of responses. They were growing in grace, and that is the business of God. He doesn't give perfect vessels a message. He brings that message to people so that it may purify them. You see, when we preach, actually we are preaching to ourselves for purification. And if the message has no impact upon the preacher himself, then don't ever think that it can make an impression upon 
the one who is listening it. And so God chooses weak vessels, gives them a message of purification, and as they present, it continues to purify them. As they behold Christ, they are changing from glory to glory. And as they speak to the people, it has the power that God intends that it should be able to have. And so here you see Wagner and John is growing in grace in their way of um, speaking to the elder people. Um, continue on, a comparison was made uh, in a general conference daily bulletin, Galatians 1 and 2, uh, Acts chapter 15, Numbers chapter 15, Luke chapter 2, Acts chapter 15 again, and um, Romans chapter 3, Acts 15 repeated, Galatians 2 and 3, Romans 4, Christ and his righteousness, uh, one reference to Acts chapter 4 verses 12, uh, 2 to Galatians chapter 1 verses 15 to 16, and uh, to Romans and then to the Gospel of John, and then to the Hebrews. Uh, and these scriptures were compared to give uh, uh, um, a clear indication of uh, the whole burden of these chapters was nothing else than uh, Christ and his righteousness. Um, this is in Pacific Press, 1890, pages 26 and 27, E.J. Wagner, Christ and his righteousness. The fact that Christ took upon himself the flesh, not of a sinless being, but of a sinful man, that is, that the flesh which he assumed had all the weaknesses and sinful tendencies to which fallen human nature is subject. And this was one of those burdens to prove that uh, we can have victory over sin because Christ partaking of our nature was able to depend on the hand of the omnipotent, the hand of his father, as we saw in the book uh, uh, devotional Maranatha, and then we also can hold on to this uh, 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 hand of omnipotence and uh, be able to overcome sin in the flesh that we are in. In fact, in the book, um, um, in the book, uh, Christ Object Lesson, page 331, Christ Object Lesson 331, this is um, what um, uh, we have. Christ object lesson, COL 331, um, 333, sorry, 0.1. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are his uh, enablings. All his biddings are enablings. And so this was the burden of... Um, uh, E.J. Wagona to give the people the message that uh, in this flesh, in this nature that we are in, when we hold to the hand of omnipotence, we can be able to obtain the righteousness of Jesus Christ and be victorious uh, in our, our daily lives. Now, A.V. Olson, Through Crisis to Victory, 1888-1901, Washington, D.C., Review and Herald, 1966, uh, page 35, he says that the real burden of the message on righteousness by faith as presented by them, but primarily by Elder Wagoner at the Minneapolis session, was to affirm the truth that the only way righteousness can be obtained is through a living faith in the Lamb of God, whose blood was shed on Calvary's cross as a propitiation for the sins of uh, the world. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being clad in the spotless robe of Christ's righteousness. This robe can neither be purchased with silver or gold, nor earned by good works. This message was a clarion call to make Christ and his righteousness the center of all our living and our preaching. It placed special emphasis on righteousness by faith as a real personal experience rather than a mere theory. Very, very interesting. And I, I just want to pull up a, a, verse, in the, a verse in the book of... Um, um, song of Songs. That is um, Song of Songs. In Song of Songs, chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. Song of Songs, chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. There are three score queens and four score 
with concubines and virgins without number. But look at verse 9 and 10. The verse I want is verse 9 and 10. My dove, my undefined, this is the child, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yeah, the queens and the concubine, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? I want you to note that, that the dove is undefined, but she is clothed with whose righteousness in her uh, undefiled state, clear as the sun, the sun of righteousness. And um, uh, Sister White amplifies says this point, and uh, just to bring something also here, I like to bring something in uh, the book. Uh, um, this is um, my life today, page uh, three hundred and eleven, amplifying this verse in uh, a song of Solomon, verse uh, verse uh, ten. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? Because the burden of the message. Evie Olson says that uh, the burden of the message was what? Uh, this message was a clarion call to make Christ and his righteousness the center of all our living and our preaching. It placed a special emphasis on righteousness by faith as a real personal experience rather than a mere theory. And this is the experience that um, we are getting that uh, this army, this undefiled dove, who is that that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? An army is an active people in a war, and they are marching undefiled, fair as the moon. Amplifying on this, in my life today, she says, my life today, she says this, glad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to end upon her final conflict. And now quoting Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 10, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners, she is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. How are they going? They are going with going clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness. And this was the burden of Wagner in 1888 General Conference session. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us to meet, can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering the robe of uh, his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. I cancel thee, he says, to buy of me white raiment that thou mayst be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Sin is defined to be transgression of the law. But Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. When on earth he said to his disciples, I have kept my father's commandments. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, we live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then, as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. To everyone, God has made an offer that will help to brace every nerve and spiritual muscle for the time of death that is to come to all to us all. I am charged with this the message. Clothe yourself with the whole arm of Christ's righteousness. And having done all you can do on your part, you have the assurance of victory. To every soul is granted the gracious opportunity of standing on the rock of ages. And so what does it mean that uh, we must brace every nerve and spiritual muscle for the time of the test is to come to us all. When you go to the book of Peter, the book of uh, Peter, and uh, I'll go to the book of Second Peter, 
um, and uh, look at uh, verses 10. Second Peter chapter one, verses 10. The question is, how can you brace every nerve and muscle to be clad in Christ's righteousness? First, Second Peter 1 Peter 1.10 says, Where could the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure? For if you do all these things, you shall never fall. The things that have been mentioned from verses 2 to verses 9. If you do things, you shall never fall. You, shall, you could have made your calling an election sure. And that is what um, actually it means. That is um, what actually it means to, to brace every nerve and spiritual muscle for the time of test that is to come to us. Continued on with the report of uh, the general conference session. Um, the message had to bring personal experience rather than a mere theory. And uh, the things that were to be looked at are the obedience to the commandments of God. And Uriah Smith had this to say, the law is spiritual, holy, just, and good, the divine standard of righteousness. Perfect obedience to it will develop perfect righteousness. And I'll be coming to these statements by Uriah Smith and uh, to some extent how they they tended to conflict with what, what we're now saying. It seems that uh, obedience to the law was placed before righteousness of Christ. And he could not differentiate or he didn't go into detail to differentiate between what kind of righteousness he was talking about, if it was imparted righteousness or imputed righteousness. There are things that Sister White will talk about righteousness, how we are counted righteous, and uh, we shall continue seeing them. So the law is spiritual, holy, just, and good, the divine standard of righteousness. Perfect obedience to it will develop perfect righteousness, and that is the only way anyone can attain to righteousness. This statement needs to be analyzed that uh, only perfect obedience can break, can attain to righteousness. There is not a seven-day Adventist in the land who has not been taught better than to suppose that in his own strength he could keep the commandments or do anything without Christ. This comparative spirit that was going on between Wagon and Uriah uh, Smith exchanging uh, 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 lines in the articles, uh, you can see it. So, sanctification was seen as the basis of salvation. That, that, that was the main problem, and this is actually what the statement by Uriah Smith, uh, this statement actually is what brings out this point number one. Sanctification was seen as the basis of salvation. We shall be looking at the basis of salvation, what it is according to the Bible and uh, Wagoner and then E.G. White. The work of Christ in justification was seen primarily in regard to our past sins of our primarily in regard to our sins of the past. Now, this is very interesting because this was a legalistic way of looking at uh, uh, righteous Christ and his righteousness. Because when you go to, uh, we shall read statements by A.G. Daniels that actually the justification of Jesus Christ covers the past, uh, that is uh, the past and the sins of the future. Not that we should be involved in sinning and repenting or uh, 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 or uh, committing sin because Christ has died for us. No, what actually A.G. Daniel meant is this. You are a sinner, but Christ has died for you. You have committed a sin in the past before you accepted Jesus Christ. Now that you have accepted Jesus Christ, his justification covers what you did in the past before you came to him. But also he says that this justification covers the sins in the future. In which way? By this, that when Christ pronounced justification, he gives you victory on the sins that may could have been performed in the future or committed in the future. And so justification covers the sin in the past and also it brings the strength to live soberly in the present world in the future with the covering of Jesus Christ. So justification does not only cover the sins in the past, but also covers the sin in the future in the way that uh, it brings the power of victory over sin. 
in science of the time, uh, this uh, submitted by anonymous fundamental principles science of the time, June uh, 4, 1874. We read this, as all have violated God's law and cannot of themselves render obedient to his just requirements, we are dependent on Christ first for justification from our past offenders and secondly for grace whereby to render acceptable obedience to his holy law in the time to come. This was what was taught in 1874, but actually it had been lost sight of and uh, uh, the people only took that the death of Jesus Christ covers the sin in the past and it doesn't cover the sin in the future. And uh, not all people believed on what was right. The people had lost the message and they needed to be directed to Jesus Christ again so that uh, they may recapture the lost article of justification by faith. These are the words of uh, A.G. Daniels, the lost article of justification by faith. In Christ Our Righteousness, A.G. Daniel, page 6, paragraph 1, she, he says, The word of God clearly portrays the way of righteousness by faith. The writings of the spirit of prophecy greatly amplify and elucidate the subject. In our blindness and dullness of heart, we have wandered far out of the way and for many years have been failing to appropriate this sublime truth. You see what Daniel now is saying? But all the while our great leader has been calling his people to come into line on this great fundamental of the gospel, receiving by faith the imputed righteousness of Christ for sins that are past, and the imparted righteousness of Christ for the revealing the divine nature in human flesh. Wagona, man's obedience can never satisfy God's law. And you see, Uriah Smith was talking about uh, sanctification being the basis of righteousness, while Wagona is saying nothing of that sort, actually. There was this nuances, there were these um, subliminal uh, uh, speeches that contradicted each other. So work on a man's obedience can never satisfy God's law. Christ's imputed righteousness alone is the basis of our acceptance by God. And we shall see statements by E.G. White towards the same. We constantly need the covering of Christ's righteousness, not just for our past sin. So it means even for our future. That is the grace to enable us to overcome sin. And talking about... Um, Christ's imputed righteousness alone is the basis of our acceptance before God. Come to think about this, that uh, imparted righteousness is a fruit of imputed righteousness. Get this, that what we now manifest in our saved condition is a fruit of what Christ has accomplished for us. And so, while uh, we shall be judged by, um, by our works, our acceptance is based on what Christ has done, not what we have done. Now, it seems like an oxymoron to speak like that, but uh, that is the mystery of uh, the part of the mystery of Christ and his righteousness. That uh, if we say that uh, Christ has died for us and has procured for us righteousness, won't our life reflect the same? And if it doesn't reflect the same, doesn't it mean that we have not accepted him? And if we haven't accepted him, how do we, uh, 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 um, how do we suppose that we shall pass by the judgment bar while professing godliness, while denying the power therein? It is impossible. And so, E.J. Wagner and Christ and his righteousness, let the reader try to picture the sin. He stands the law as the swift witness against the sinner. It cannot change and it will not call a sinner a righteous man. The convicted sinner tries again and again to obtain righteousness from the law, but it resists all his advances. It cannot be bribed by any amount of penance or professedly good deeds, but here stands Christ full of grace as well as of truth, calling the sinner to him. Now, if we can be able to outperform the law, I use the word outperform because the law is uh, a mirror of Christ or God's character, and in order for you to be accepted, then you have to do that which can match the law or outperform it. Do that which is more than what the law requires. Now, you tell me if man can be able to do that, to mimic the righteousness of the law and be able to match God's requirement without Christ. 
If he can do that, then he can buy out his salvation. Then he can stand in the pearly gates and say, I am here because I have done this and this. And so as a sinful person tries to please the law so that he may be accepted, it continues resisting him because the more he tries, the more he fails. Because as we near more to Christ, we find ourselves more fallen. Amplifying this point, again, this is, um, um, I'll go to Sister White writing to show that uh, no matter what we do, actually we cannot bribe our way out of the law. And uh, she says that, um, uh, look at this in uh, 1888 messages, page uh, 816, paragraph one. I ask, how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers, all the grace, all the penitence. Let me just go back to the quote by Wagner and see what he's saying. Again, he says, let the reader try to pick the sin. Here stands the law as the swift witness against the sinner. It cannot change and it will not call a sinner a righteous man. The convicted sinner tries again and again to obtain righteousness from the law, but it resists all his advances. It cannot be bribed by any amount of penance or professedly good deeds, but here stands Christ full of grace. That is what I want you to note, as well as of truth calling the sinner to him. This is the grace that we are looking in the 1888 messages by E.G. White. I ask how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers, all the grace, all the penitence, all the inclination, and all the pardon of sins in presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith, which is also the gift of God. If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man, and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting a part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition will be rejected as treason. Standing in the presence of their creator and looking upon the unsurpassed glory which enshrouds his person, they are looking upon the Lamb of God given from the foundation of the world to a life of humiliation, to be rejected of sinful men, to be despised, to be crucified. Who can measure the infinity of the sacrifice? Going to the book of Acts. Going to the book of Acts. Uh, this is um, what, uh, again, we read in Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And that is why... E.G. Uh, e. White says that all the penitence, all the grace, all the inclination, all these things are given by God through Christ. And he, you cannot repent of yourself. If you would come before the Lord to repent of yourself without the wooing of his spirit, you could only come into the sanctuary and say, God, you know how I have been good. I have been faithful in time. I have never passed somebody on the road. I have done this. These are the kind of prayers you come before the Lord with if he doesn't give you the gift of repentance. So if God doesn't provide for all these things, man can try to bribe himself out of the law or to bribe the law, but uh, he will find himself short and short of attaining that term um, which um, the Lord will want him to be. So, as we try to wrap up this, again, he continues, At last the sinner, weary of the vain struggle to get righteousness from the law, listens to the voice of Christ and pleads to his outstretched arms. Hiding in Christ, he is covered with his righteousness, and now, behold, he has obtained through faith in Christ that for which he has been vainly striving. He has the righteousness which the law requires, and it is the genuine article. Again, uh, Daniels will talk about this genuine article. He has this genuine article because he obtained it from the source of righteousness, from the very place when the law came. E.J. Wagner, Christ and His Righteousness, Auckland, CA, Pacific Press, 1890. And so this was the 
stakes that were at Minneapolis um, proving what is Christ, what is uh, the salvation, the basis of our salvation, who provides everything, what is the relation between the law and the gospel. And uh, remember the statement of E.G. White that uh, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. We need to preach Christ in the law. And in the statement TM 91, 92, she says that men had lost sight of Jesus Christ and they needed to be pointed back to his divine image. He who has the merits, who has the rich gifts to dispense to the sons of men. And so, as I just conclude this, uh, I just want us to see the setting of the Minneapolis 1888 and the issues at stake and what was the burden of Wagoner that um, uh, he had to amplify Christ's righteousness that it was the only thing that can match the law that had been broken and man cannot obtain the righteousness of the law without Christ. And the genuine article is from Christ and not from man. And all our advances towards the law, if they are not sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ and uttered before God in the words that even we even cannot pronounce, it would amount to nothing. Through this defiled lips that we offer prayers, Christ takes our prayers and with groanings, he presents before the Father, and that is how our, 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 our prayers are accepted. But men thought they could keep the law better without involving Jesus Christ. And even today, that is the issue. Many reforms, many upright doctrines, but without the Spirit of Christ. Why are we still here with the, all the right doctrines? It is because man thinks if he can understand things, then he has come to the possession, into possession with Christ's righteousness. No, the devil is in possession with a lot of truths, but he doesn't, doesn't have a saving faith because he doesn't need Jesus Christ at all. You remember the war in heaven was about Jesus Christ. He saw that his loveliness was not derived from Christ. In fact, um, I don't know if I can trace that just speedily and I read a verse and then we close. Uh, that um, he didn't, he saw that um, his beauty uh, I'm sorry, I won't get this, but um, he saw that his beauty was not uh, from uh, God. I think to TDG, the daughters of God, uh, I'll just uh, read something from the daughters of God, uh, page 128, paragraph 2. Although this is not the quote I want, but uh, it will make my point uh, at this moment because I can't find the right quote that uh, he didn't see that his beauty, he derived the beauty from Christ. But uh, in TDG 128, uh, paragraph 2, angels were expelled from heaven because they will not work in harmony with God. They fell from their high estate because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves and they forgot that their beauty, I think this is this it, their beauty of person and character came from the Lord Jesus. This fact, the fallen angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten Son of God and they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. Now, we have read this quote in the meetings of one true God to show that uh, Christ was the only begotten Son of God, which is true. But there is another aspect of this quote that um, Satan or Lucifer came to the point he thought that he possessed the right character character without Jesus Christ. And today men are in this position that Lucifer was in in heaven. They think that they have obtained righteousness or they are right and it is without Jesus Christ. And that is why there is a lot of boasting. There is a lot of uh, pride and exaltation. People want to be looked at. People want to be called every now and then because they think that the beauty of person and the character that they have 
do not come from the Lord Jesus Christ, but it has been, it has come from their reading and having concordances and having all these um, tools to study the word of God until they have arrived to the truth via these tools and not via Christ. And so their, 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 their eminence in expounding the scriptures and in presenting is devoid of Christ. Christ is not mentioned in it, but what they have come to, uh, uh, to, to, to understand, what they have come to, uh, to know. This is what they give to men. They do not present Jesus Christ. So their beauty of person and character is not from the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you read the quote very well. And this fact, the fallen angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten son of God and they came to consider they were not to consult him. So they came, they, they, they didn't see Christ was, was anything to consult because already they possessed the beauty and the character without him. So why consult him? But they never knew that without Christ, you cannot come to the Father. You cannot look at the Father without Christ in between because you are a mere creature. No one, and in John 14, 6, no one comes to the Father unless through Christ. But here is Lucifer wanting to come to God without Christ. And that could not happen. And that is why Christ is the only begotten Son of God, which means he who is like God. And through him, you can find an avenue to the Father because the Son condescends to the uh, real position that you are in so that he may connect humanity with divinity and bring uh, and uh, uh, reconcile divinity with humanity. Or uh, what we can say that um, he is that angel of the Lord that without him you cannot. And so in ending... I like just to bring something to our attention. That is Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, as uh, we close this, verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth the bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. It is the Lord that will cause his righteousness to shine upon us. And when he comes, this end of Revelation 18, the whole earth will be filled with the glory of Christ. Not our own righteousness, but his own uh, our righteousness. We are told that uh, this heavenly loom, this heavenly loom, uh, sorry, has no human devising in it. Look at this. In uh, Faith I Live by page 113, paragraph 3. This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity wrote out a perfect character, and his, this character he offers to impart to us. All our righteousness are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, verse 6. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Sin is defined by the, to be the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 5 and 4. But Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. How I pray that uh, we may obtain this genuine article, that we may not be found naked. Shall we pray? We thank you, Heavenly Father, for, for thy Son, Jesus Christ, in whom or we find our redemption by his spirit. And Lord, we thank you because the emancipation papers have been signed by his blood. And so we thank you because, Lord, we can obtain this genuine article. 
let the burden of the 1888 messages be our burden in this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.